It's time to get started. It's 11 o'clock, so I'll get, I'll get started here. Welcome to the second class in the series on the book of Revelation. We started with an introduction last week. Now we'll actually get into the text, so I hope it won't be as boring as it was last week. Um, so the book of Revelation is a hard book to understand, a hard book to get into. I hope this guided tour will help somewhat. Um, last week I covered a little bit about who John was, why he was on the island of Patmos. He was arrested by the Romans and sent into exile on the island of Patmos. I'll, I put up a map uh, last time, showed where the island of Patmos was and where the seven cities were that he was writing to. I'll put up that map again in a little bit. So give you kind of the lay of the land. Um, last time was the historical and literary context, uh, geographical context as well of the book of Revelation. And uh, today, September 24th, the seven letters, or actually the seven messages to the seven churches within the book of Revelation. And then you can see the layout of the rest of the class through October and November. First, a bit of old business. Lynn asked the question last time. I mentioned, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, you know, that uh, there's, there, there really isn't much in Revelation about the so-called rapture. So Lynn asked, well, then where does the idea of the rapture come from? So I couldn't quote chapter and verse, but I will now. I was, I, I was, I was correct. I guess Matthew, and and and, and I was correct about that. There's a, a couple of uh, verses in in Matthew. Uh, there's a link to Bible Gateway. Uh, Matthew 24 verses 40 and 41. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. That's one of the that's one of the passages that people point to and claim. Well, that that shows there's going to be a rapture. Um, I don't know about that. I'm not one who believes in a rapture. I'm too much of a Lutheran to believe in rapture, I guess. Uh, but some people point to that and say, well, that that that, that proves it. Um, the, now, if you look at the context, the whole, whole passage there is verses uh, 36 to 44. Uh, now, the point of this section, the whole section there, that group of verses, is how ex unexpected the end will be. There's a, also some verses about how a, a thief might come and rob your house. Now, if you know the thief is coming and when the thief is coming, of course, you'll stay up and watch, but you don't know that. So the end is going to come very unexpectedly, according to these verses, and that's the point of the text. I'm not sure the point is exactly what the event is going to be like, uh, right? Uh, so I'm not sure the point is that people are going to be disappearing in front of our eyes. The point is how ex unexpected the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the end will be. Uh, but it, it's a little bit hard to explain away, even so. Uh, then I, 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 I knew it was from one of the letters of Paul, but I couldn't remember which one. It's from First, first uh, Thessalonians. Uh, the text goes as follows. This is what some people also point to as far as, uh, well, this is the rapture. Um, verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. Uh, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. Now, one thing to, interesting thing to note is that Paul believed that he would be, still be alive when the end came, right? We, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with, uh, with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Um, so some people say, well, you know, that's uh, everybody caught up uh, in the clouds with the Lord. Uh, that's the rapture. Now, again, uh, think about what the author probably meant here. Uh, this is to reassure those whose loved ones had passed away. People were asking, well, that's all well and good that the, the, uh, end, the end is going to come and we'll be with the Lord, but how about people who have died? What are going to, what's going to happen to them, my loved ones who have passed away? So this was, uh, the purpose of this, these words are to reassure people whose uh, loved ones are no longer around. They have died. And um, <coughs> also, uh, there's a little note in my study Bible. It says, to meet the Lord. See, what this is describing is uh, Paul is using uh, a description of people in a city who are waiting for uh, their king to come and visit their city. And they're watching for the king's procession to come. And when they see the procession approaching, they rush out of the city and rush out to the procession to greet it and escort the king's procession back into the city, right? Uh, they're not leaving the city to go someplace else. They're escorting the king back into the city. I'm thinking of the words of um, Pastor Mark's book, Coming Home to Earth. <laughs> Uh, and the words at the end of Revelation, and the home of God will be among mortals. So I'm not sure at all that this represents um, a, a rapture in any sense. Uh, it's, uh, it seems to be representing the people of earth escorting God home to earth. Anyway, that's my point of view on it. Uh, you may have a different point of view. Um, if you feel that there's going to be a rapture, that's fine, I respect that. Um, but that's my opinion. Anyway, that's the old, bus the, the old business here. Uh, I know the question was asked, well then where does the idea of a rapture come from? I think those two passages are, are, are where that idea comes from. Uh, last time I, I showed uh, three books that I've uh, been using to put this class together. I'm going to add a fourth uh, that I used quite a bit for the subject this time, the messages to the seven churches. Uh, it's uh, the lesson on revelation from a, a class from Crossways International. Uh, so I want to add, I want to give credit where credit is due because I, I used that l lesson uh, quite a bit in preparing for today's lesson. Um, I, I taught uh, cross, uh, lessons from Crossways quite a bit uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, I recently uh, became interested again in, well, what, what, what's Crossways up to, Crossways International these days? Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> I have to report that Crossways International is no more. They dissolved a couple of years ago. Uh, the pandemic did them in. Uh, they made their money by selling class materials for people who got together in person around a table to uh, study the Bible. And of course, people didn't do that for a couple of years when everybody was sick with COVID. Uh, so that uh, the pandemic uh, did that company in, and they're not uh, not producing material anymore. But anyway, I still have all of their material, and <coughs> because I was uh, I taught from I taught their their classes. So I I used their uh, uh, their class on Revelation uh, uh, quite a bit in preparing today's lesson. Now we're actually going to get into the text today. Uh, the first, uh, the first chapter. We're going to go through the first three chapters. The first chapter is an introduction, and then chapters two and three are the messages to the seven churches in Asia. So, introduction. Uh, three parts to the introduction. The first is a prologue, and um, basically, what the pro prologue says 
these first three verses is, this is a revelation from God through Jesus Christ communicating to, communicated to John by an angel. Let's take a look at the text. Text, the, I'm taking the text uh, uh, by uh, showing the text uh, uh, by a link through uh, to Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway is a, is a free website, but um, they make their money not by charging users, but by selling ads. So they make you look at advertising. Um, I'll try to click off the advertising when I can. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, and <coughs> sorry, and he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads the word of, words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Um, that's the prologue. Uh, next is uh, epistolary salutation. That's a $20 phrase that means just the greeting of a letter. Uh, it, uh, it basically says, from John to the churches in Asia, although he uses many, many more words to say that. Um, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then we have a little stanza of poetry. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. This is a little, a little bit of a quote from the apocalyptic section of the book of Daniel. He is coming with the clouds. The first of the apocalyptic chapters in Daniel, uh, chapter 7. Um, and I... And, and, and then I saw one like a, a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Uh, the, uh, chapter 7 of Daniel, uh, Daniel sees a vision of the author of Daniel, probably his real name was not Daniel, but the author of Daniel um, has a vision and he sees all kinds of strange monsters which represent uh, the uh, kings who are oppressing the people of God. And, uh, and then suddenly he sees uh, one that is not a monster, but one who actually looks like a human being. The term he uses is son of man, who emphasizes his, his human character. And I saw one like a son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. So this is sort of a quote from that apocalyptic section of Daniel. So it is to be, amen, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega, you probably know, are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So this is like if we would say everything from A to Z, first to last. From God to the church, from John to the churches in Asia. The next section, verses 9 through 20, uh, inaugural vision and a commission. So John reveals his first vision, and this is how he was called to, to write this letter, how he was commanded to write these things to you. <clears throat> I, John, your brother, who share with you the persecution and the kingdom and the endurance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was exiled because of his testifying to Jesus. Uh, the Romans at this time were not friendly to Christians. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was in some ty type of uh, ecstasy, a trance. Lord's day is, of course, Sunday. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to 
to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. <clears throat> then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and then in the midst of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as white wool and white as snow. Here white symbolizes victory. Sometimes white symbolizes purity. Most often in Revelation it symbolizes victory. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came, <clears throat> came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining with full force. When I saw him, I felt, fell at his feet as though dead, but he placed his right hand on me, saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and see I am alive forever and ever and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you have seen, what is and what is to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven light lampstands are the seven churches. Apparently the seven churches had guardian angels, and those are the seven stars. So that's the uh, introduction to the book of Revelation um, and how John was called to write this letter to the seven churches. Um, questions so far? This was definitely a form of literature. Uh, Larry's asking the question, is this a form of literature at the time? Apocaly apocalyptic literature was common at the time and especially common during times of fear or turmoil, social fear and turmoil. Uh, uh, this uh, type of literature uh, came out of times like that. Uh, for one thing, it was a way of communicating to people that were under oppression, that were oppressed. That was, that's one of the reasons that the language was symbolic, the language used was symbolic, in hopes that it would speak with meaning to the people under oppression, but its meaning would be hidden from the oppressors, in this case, the, the Roman Empire so that uh, John was no doubt hoping to get this letter under the radar of the Romans so it wouldn't be confiscated and destroyed, but it would find its way to the people who would understand its meaning and find hope and sustenance in its message. So definitely during times of oppression, uh, this type of literature was very common. Lynn. Do we know why seven was such an important number? Why seven was such an important number? Oh, there are various speculations. There are speculations why seven was important. It may have been one thing, for instance, is people who watched the heavens, which were, was also very common in those days. People tried to find meanings in the, uh, in, 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 up in the heavens. There are there, if, you, if you watch the heavens, the stars present a fixed field, but there are five moving stars, right? Because there are five planets that are visible to the, to the naked eye, plus the sun and the moon, right? So there are seven objects that move around within the fixed field of stars. That may be one thing, and there were various theories about each one of these seven moving objects were fixed in a, a celestial sphere, right? So, I, you know, that may be one, uh, one place where the number seven came from as a symbol of perfection and completeness. 
<coughs> it's a very common uh, number used well all through the Bible as a symbol of uh, perfection or completeness. Um, uh, very common. Yes. Oh, the seven churches. Yeah, the um, the the seven churches are churches in Asia Minor, which is what we would call the today the country of Turkey. And uh, John was writing to the the churches in these uh, seven cities. Uh, I will put up a map. Let's see. Do I have what's the next? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Good, 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 good uh, segue to this map. So on this map, you see uh, the center, just to the left of center, in that little circle, there's an island. That's the island of Patmos, where a John was exiled. And he is writing to his, presumably his friends, in these uh, churches in these seven cities, uh, the coastal cities of um, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum, as well as the cities in, inland, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, right? Um, now, exactly why he picked these cities, maybe he knew people in these cities. These cities may be, now according to, the, one of the books that I'm using is the, a book titled Revelations, plural, by Elaine Pagels a professor at uh, Princeton. Uh, according to her, he was speaking not only to, not just to Christians in general, but particularly to Christians that had a Jewish background. So maybe these churches were mainly uh, Jewish Christians. And that John was uh, saying to these Jewish Christians, well, yes, you've accepted uh, Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, but don't let that be an excuse to start acting like Roman pagans. Keep, it, keep to your Jewish beliefs. And I'll say a little bit more about that, uh, you know, as we go along here. Um, so it may be the Jewish population of these churches in these seven cities. It may be that John was particularly uh, familiar with these, the people at these churches, or uh, something of that nature. But uh, he's writing to these, uh, the churches in these seven cities. Yeah, the, the, there are dots for other cities. The red dots are the, these seven cities in particular, yeah. Um, this uh, land mass uh, uh, on the upper right, uh, the, it's labeled Asia. It's, uh, was called Asia Minor in those days. It's, this is the uh, southwestern tip of uh, today's country of Turkey. Anything else? Now, chapter two, now we get into the actual messages to the individual seven churches. First, Ephesus. We're going to start down with the coastal churches uh, down in the south and move up and then down through the uh, inland churches. This is the order in the, uh, in the letter. Church at Ephesus. Ephesus, uh, quite a large city, population of 250,000, uh, fairly large at that time. Well, I mean, it wasn't as large as Rome, certainly, but uh, or Athens, or but you know, for a, a city in Asia Minor, it was pretty large. It was a hub for trade routes; um, a lot of people passing through there. It was home of temples to pagan gods, Artemis in particular, and I'll say more about that in just a minute. Artemis, the um, uh, Roman goddess of Roma and others. The Apostle Paul worked there. You're familiar with the uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, of course. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, in, in putting together Artemis and Paul, uh, Paul ran into some trouble with some silversmiths in, uh, in Ephesus. 
uh, I want to read that. Uh, Acts 19, verses 23 through 41. About that time, no little disturbance broke out concerning the way. The way, of course, is it was re that referred to Christians at that time. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the artisans. These he gathered together with the workers of the same trade and said, men, you know that we get our wealth from this business. You also see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul is persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of our great goddess Artemis will be scorned and she will be deprived of her majesty that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. When they heard this, they were enraged and shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion and people rushed together to the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's travel companions. Paul wished to go into the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some officials of the province of Asia, who were friendly to him, sent him a message urging him not to venture into the theater. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. It was a riot, and they were rioting, and they didn't know why. Some of the crowd gave instructions to Alexander, whom the Jews had pushed forward, and Alexander motioned for silence and tried to make a defense before the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours all of them shouted in unison, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. But when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, citizens of Ephesus, who is there <coughs> who does not know that the city of, of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the statue that fell from heaven. Since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. You have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. Therefore, Demetrius and the artisans with him have a complaint against anyone. The courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges there against one another. If there is anything further you want to know, it must be settled in the regular assembly for we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. When he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. So that's the trouble that uh, Paul had with the artisans, the silver artisans, and the uh, Artemis, the temple of Artemis. Okay. With that little aside, I just thought that was an interesting connection. That was before social media. Yes, yeah, yeah. This was a this, this was a flash mob before social media. Okay. That aside, let's read what what the John's message is to the church at Ephesus. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This is to your credit you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. And one thing I have to say, Nicolaitans, we don't know much about who this group was, except obviously John, John doesn't like them. So they must have been leading the people astray, at least according to the, th the thinking of John. At least this group will come up again 
And about all we know is that they must have been a bad influence on these churches. So, now all of these churches, most of them, there are praises, there are reproaches, and there are promises. Not all of them, but most of them, there are three. Uh, the church at Ephesus, the praises are endurance, bearing up under persecution, and they test false claims to see whether or not they're true. Reproaches, they had lost the zeal they had at first and promises uh, the, ones, the, the, the ones who are faithful will eat from the tree of life in paradise. Next church at Smyrna, moving up the coast. Smyrna was called the Flower of Asia. It was a magnificent trade city. There, of course, were temples to pagan gods, temples to Roma, divine Tiberius and the Roman Senate. Tiberius, now remember, Roman emperors were considered gods, sons of God. There was an emperor cult that deified emperors, starting with Caesar Augustus, uh, was a deified, thought of as a son of God, and, and all of the emperors after Augustus were thought of as gods. And, uh, cities built temples, C cities competed to build temples to Roman, Roman emperors. So there's a, temp uh, a temple to uh, Tiberius there in Smyrna. So let's see what the message to uh, Smyrna was. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich. Well, poverty in terms of wealth, but rich in terms of spirit. I know the slander on the part of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have affliction. That's symbolic. It means the, the affliction will be short, a uh, short time. Be faithful until, until death and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. Second death is the final judgment. First death is one physical death, but then second death here means then the final judgment. Uh, you will not be harmed by the second death means you will not be condemned to hell. That's what, uh, that's what that means. So praises, standing firm despite tribulation, poverty, and slander. Reproaches none. He has, doesn't have anything bad to say about this church. Promises, the crown of life and preservation from the second death. Now, here's the interesting. I want to, in all of these churches, there's a phrase, whoever conquers. The Greek word is the, uh, for whoever conquers is nikon. You probably recognize the root word for Nikon. It's the same as the goddess of victory and also the name of a athletic wear company here in Beaverton, right? <laughs> Anybody take a guess? Nike, Nike. Nike. yes, that's right. <laughs> and you thought you didn't know any Greek. Moving up the coast, uh, the church at Pergamum. Pergamum had a big library here. You've heard of the library at Alexandria, I suppose. Uh, well, Pergamum was second only to the library at Alexandria. Apparently it housed over 200,000 scrolls. On the hills around Pergamum, there were temples to Zeus, Athena, Asclepios, um, other, 
other gods. So what did, um, what's the message? And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. By the way, the symbol of the sharp two-edged sword coming out of the mouth, that's the word of the Lord, right? Coming out of the mouth, the word, the sharp two-edged sword coming out of the mouth is the word of the Lord. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is. This may be referred to one of the, referring to one of or more of those temples, pagan temples, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding fast to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan lives. We don't know exactly who this Antipas was, evidently a martyr. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food sacrificed to idol, idols and engage in sexual immorality. I have more to say about Balaam and Balak in just a minute. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicol Nicolaitans. And again, as I said, we don't know much about that group except that John doesn't think highly of them. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, word of the Lord. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, Nikon, I will give some of the hidden mana, and I will give a white stone, and on the stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Again, hidden things, quite common symbolism in Revelation. Mana, of course, is nourishment from heaven, White, again, is symbolizing victory. A new name, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. <coughs> Praises remaining true to God and standing firm in the faith. Reproaches, tolerating false teachers. Now, the story of Balaam and Balak is a story from way back in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. Um, the, that story in Numbers is hard to read because there are two contradictory stories woven together in Numbers 22 through 24. Uh, Balak was the king of the Moabites when the Israelites were making their way from Egypt to the Promised Land and they were making their way through Moab and uh, Balak, the king of the Moabites, was worried about this horde of Israelites passing through their country. And he called on the, um, the prophet Balaam to come and curse the Israelites to prevent them from causing trouble. Now, of course, of course God didn't, was against that and um, prohibited Balaam from coming and, 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 and making a curse on the Israelites. Now, the, the, two, the two contradictory stories is about whether Balaam obeyed God or, uh, or, or not. And the story that, the, the story that leads to this uh, uh, criticism of Balaam is, is, is when uh, Balaam um, disagreed with the Lord, went against the Lord, and, and went and, and cursed the Israelites. Uh, and here's what uh, Numbers has to say about the result of that a misbehavior by Balaam. They killed the kings of Midian, Avi, Rechem, Zerher, Reba, the five kings of Midian, Midian, in addition to others who were slain by them, and they also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. And again, these women here, uh, the, the Midianite, Midianite women, some of the women uh, uh, seduced the men of the Israelite men. 
these women here on Balaam's advice made the Israelites act treacherously against the Lord in the affair of Peor so that the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. It's, that was attributed to uh, the advice of Balaam and so that's what he did wrong and that's what led to hear to um, to the message of the, of the church at Pergamum saying, now you're acting like Balaam did and that's bad, so don't do that. Tolerating false teachers. Pro promises hidden manna, that's heavenly nourishment, and a white a stone with a new name on it. New name may be a reference to um, a passage in Isaiah For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. It's a blessing on Israel. So that may be, this, the new name may be a reference to that passage in Isaiah. To the church at Thyatira, now we're inland and going down from the north. Thyatira, a military outpost in a commercial city. Many workers' guilds were within its walls. Let's check out Thyatira. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, faith, service, and endurance. I know that your latest works are greater than the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Jezebel is not her real name. He's criticizing a woman who's leading these people astray. Um, this is a metaphor, and I'll talk more about Jezebel in just a second. Who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servant to engage in sexual immorality. Again, a metaphor. And to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Beware, I am throwing her on a bed. And those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress unless they, unless they repent of her doings. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts. And I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast to what you have, have until I come. To everyone who conquers and continues to do my works to the end, I will give authority over the nations to rule them with an iron scepter as when clay pots are shattered, even as I also received authority from my father. To the one who conquers, I will also give the morning star. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the, to anyone who has an ear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Praises, faith and love, growth in service. Reproaches, heeding Jezebel. Um, uh, back in um, First and Second Kings, the uh, kings of the northern kingdom of Israel are discussed. Uh, you may remember that uh, after Solomon's reign, uh, the United Kingdom of Israel split in north and south. The southern kingdom of Judah was ruled by exclusively by descendants of King David. The northern kingdom of Israel was ruled by a number of different dynasties. Most of the dynasties ended by assassination. Um, the dynasty of Omri which is, was relatively successful, consisted of four kings, Omri himself, and followed by his son, Ahab. 
Uh, Ahab married the daughter of the king of Sidon, a, a pagan nation on the coast. Um, they worshiped the god, uh, we pronounce it Baal, it was probably actually pronounced Baal. Um, Jezebel was her name. Um, Jezebel led the uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, into worship of the pagan god Baal. Um, let's uh, see what the Bible has to say about Jezebel. 1 Kings 16, 31 and 19, 1 and 2. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Jeroboam was the first king of the uh, uh, northern kingdom of Israel. He took as his wife Jezebel, daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And again, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets, the prophets of the pagan Baal, with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she's put out a contract on Elijah. So that's what, that, that, that's what we're talking about when we say Jezebel, when we're using the metaphor of Jezebel about this woman uh, in Thyatira. Immorality is, again, a, a metaphor for... Uh, loss in faith for being unfaithful to God. It's a common metaphor in the Bible. For example, the, the prophet Hosea deliberately married an unfaithful woman so he would know what God felt like when Israel was unfaithful to God. And then in the Gospels, at one point, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you adulterous generation. He wasn't using adultery literally. He was accusing the Pharisees of being unfaithful to God. So here in immorality, and there are other places in Revelation where uh, sexual purity is used as a metaphor for uh, faithfulness. Eating food offered to idols. I gotta watch my time here, but I think I'm gonna go all the way till noon today. Eating food offered to idols. Um, John is very strict about this. It probably reflects his Jewish background. Um, He's stricter than Paul is about that. Uh, this, uh, but according to Jewish law, it was forbidden to eat meat that came from animals that were sacrificed to idols. And, and, and John, uh, in this book, in this letter, uh, warns about that. Now, Paul was um, not so strict. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Romans 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. When I, the first time I read this verse, I said, well, if I eat only vegetables, I'd be weak too. But, <laughs> but that's, of course, that's not what this means. What he's talking about is that, um, you know, in... Um, for Jewish Christians, Christians with a Jewish background, it, was, it, it had been forbidden uh, to, to eat meat from uh, animals that were sacrificed to idols. So if, if they weren't, the, the people who were strong in their Christian faith, of course, idols m meant nothing to them. And well, so what if the meat came from animals sacrificed to idols? Idols have no power. You could eat the meat and it didn't make any difference, right? But if you had a Jewish background, it might be faith shaking to discover the meat you were eating came from one of those animals, right? And so, so uh, Paul is saying, well, if you have a strong faith and you're able to eat that meat without, without it getting you all rattled, well, that's fine, go ahead and eat, eat it. But there are some people that's going to really bother them and the problem is that if you go into a meat market in one of these pagan cities, you have no idea where that meat is coming from. So the only way you can be sure is just don't eat meat. 
And that's the, what this comment is. Well, the weak eat only vegetables. They just avoid meat altogether. And Paul's comment is, there's room for everybody. Some eat, some eat meat and some don't, and that's fine. You just, all, let's all get along here. Uh, so Paul's very tolerant. John is not so much so. It may be because of his, his uh, he has a Jewish background. Promises. <clears throat> they will share in his messianic rule over the nations. Morning star. That means, remember the t term morning star, that means Je Jesus himself. And that, that's a forward reference to, um, to uh, a, a Revelation 22. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. To the church at Sardis. Sardis was once a city of great wealth, splendor, and power. Now, its greatness has passed at this point, but it uh, remained a large city. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, you have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, obey it and repent, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not erase your name from the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Praise is none. Reproaches spiritual deadness. Promises the faith will be faithful will be clothed in white, meaning victory. Their names will be will stand in the book of life. Another word about the book of life. This is from Malachi chapter three. Then those who revered the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord took note and listened, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who revered the Lord and thought on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, my special possession on the day when I act, and I will spare them as parents spare their children who serve them. Then once more you shall see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. And another promise, Jesus will confess their names before God and his angels. Finally, we get to the church at Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a gateway for Greek culture to places to the east. It was located in a region that was subject to severe earthquakes. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one, will, and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door that no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make known those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one takes away your crown. If you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. You will never go out of it. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. 
Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Praises, remaining loyal and keeping the word. Reproaches, none. Promises, key of David, symbol of authority. Let's look at Isaiah 22. I will pl place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. So Revelation is quoting Isaiah. As to pillars in the temple of God and new names, <clears throat> that signifies citizenship in the new city of God. And this again is a forward reference to the last part of Revelation. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. To the church at Laodicea, this was a crossroads of commerce and trading, center for banking and manufacturing of eye medica medications. Now this, this is important here, and I'll get to it in just a second for the reason for that. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot, cold, nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white robes to clothe yourself and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. That's the ironic comment I want to point out. The center of manufacture of eye medication needs a salve to make them see again. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his, on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear to hear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Praises none. Reproaches being lukewarm, complacent, self-satisfied. These were spiritual couch potatoes. Promises the faithful will share his table and the faithful will share his throne. But they've got to get up off their couch and start producing spiritual fruit. Now I'd like to close, it's noon, I'd like to close with the question, this is a take home test, right? It's not gonna be graded, but just something to think about. What would Christ say to St. Andrew? Are we Philadelphia, Laodicea, all of the above, a combination of the seven churches? Revelation challenges us to look for analogous issues today. What's facing, what issues are facing us today? What are the wake-up calls we need to hear? We're in a time of transition, so what's God saying to us in this time? I'll leave these all blank, and you can fill them in in your own minds this week. Praises, what praises, what reproaches, what promises? Yeah, I, I, I'm aware. Pat told me about that. Your Horizon team, each of you had to write a letter from the angel to St. Andrew. Yes, and you had to, <clears throat> I, I know each one of you had to address it in a special way. Pat said, to the church with the solar panels. And 
and, and, and somebody said to, to the church with the forest or the church with the tapestry. And yes, right, yeah. So, you know, t t try it out this week if you want to. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll uh, continue with Revelation next week.